Friends, this show is completely unrehearsed. The only part of it that can be done over is the announcement. Now, just a couple of minutes ago, we started filming it, and the announcer gave the title. Stop, world, I want to get on. And some woman shrieked at the title, and we had to do it over. I hope it appears that funny to you. <laughs> I must tell you, first of all, about some things that happened to me. I was preaching not very long ago. And I noticed down in the front pew a mother with a three- or four-year-old boy. And she was trying to keep him very quiet. But after I had talked for 15 minutes that must have seemed 15 hours to him, he tugged at his mother's sleeve. And he says, Mommy, is it really that hard to get to heaven? <laughs> And another little boy, when he went to confession, he had in the back of his mind the commandments. And he could be heard going through the commandments in one fashion or another. And then after he had named them to himself, then he would begin the confession of sins. And he was saying, uh, no strange gods before me. No, I didn't adore any strange gods. Thou shalt uh, keep holy the name of the Lord. I, I cursed a couple of times, Father, and keep holy the Sabbath day. I, I, went, I went to Mass every Sunday. Honor the father and mother. I, I disobeyed my mother about 18 times and my father about six times. Thou shalt not kill. I didn't kill anybody. Uh, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Sister told me to skip that. <laughs> I remember going into one classroom and saying to a little boy, tell me what you have to do to get forgiveness of sins. He said, you have to sin first. <laughs> well, you heard the title. The title was actually inspired by a show that was here on Broadway a few years ago. Stop, world, I want to get off. Now we're changing that to stop, world, I want to get on. Why are we changing it? Obviously, stop, world, I want to get off is because people are just sick of living. Our point is that perhaps never before were men so concerned with the world as they are at the present time. It has always been a concern, of course. Remember Shakespeare? All the world's a stage. And men and women, merely actors. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. Wordsworth, he was somewhat disgusted with it. The world is too much with us, late and soon. And I'm sure that Thomas Hood, if he had lived in our times, would have said, stop, world, I want to get off, because he wrote, the world is a wilderness, and every tree bears the burden of our tears. Those are the old views. But I wonder. If ever in human history, the world, I do not mean the spirit of the world, just the world itself and all that that word can mean, was ever so much the concern of hearts as at the present time. Just let me give you some examples of how the world has been discovered, why it is a concern. First of all, our age has discovered humanity. Humanity. The world is one. We're all born of one blood. We're very much concerned about the gap 
that exists between the rich nations and the poor nations. It burdens our consciences that by the year 2000, according to the UN, it will be necessary for Asia to have four times the amount of food it has at the present time. Latin America will have to have four times the amount of food as now, and Africa three times. So humanity concerns us. Then we have another interest in the world. We have the interest of science. Technology. Our knowledge has probably increased more in the last 100 years than it did in well, all previous history. It almost seems as if to our generation has been given the capacity to unlock all of the secrets of nature. Remember the poet who said, I drew the bolt of nature's secrecies. One can imagine all the secrets of nature pouring out. So that we live in a, not just in a world of gadgetry, we live in this beautiful world of technology. And finally, the world has become our concern through what might be called world involvement. In other words, there is a fondness today for doing social work, helping the minorities, bettering the inner, inner city, helping those that are socially disinherited. Young men and women are dedicated today as they never have been to all of these social causes. They want to be, as they say, involved in the world. I remember during the council, I was waiting one day for the bus that took us to the council, and I saw a street cleaner in front of the hotel where I was staying, and I went up to him and I said, uh, how long will you work today? He said, 12 hours. What time did you get up? He said, four o'clock this morning. And I said, what is your duty? He says, nothing but just sweeping the gutters. About a mile of gutters here in Rome. How much do you earn? He told me it was really a trivial wage. I said, tell me your philosophy of life. And he said, you're going to the council, aren't you? Yes. You're going to make important decisions for the church and the world. Yes. He said, but if I clean my gutters with a greater dedication than you do that work, the Lord is far more pleased with me. That's right. He saw that we have work in the world and it can be a dedicated and divine and holy work. Now, this is the good side. There's a kind of a bad side to this too. I'm going to mention it for just a few minutes and then I'm going to get back again to the good side. This concern with the world is called secularism. It, its bad side is that some would like to do away with the divine and the sacred. We've had a series of thinkers in our day that believe that in order to uphold the world, one has to destroy the divine. That's one of the reasons, incidentally, for the God is dead movement. These poor thinkers believe that in order to make room for the world, you've got to make, get rid of God. Bultmann, 
It says in order to make room for the Christian message, you have to get rid of the historical Christ, practically. And we have the author of Secular City. He practically identifies the secular city and the kingdom of God. And even in the field of religion itself, Today, the holy are on the defensive. This world spirit has gotten hold of us to such an extent that many do not like the holy. I may tell you that it's gotten so bad <laughs> that when any of you people see us priests on our knees, you ask us if we lost our contact lenses. <laughs> well, that's enough of that. <clears throat> so now let's get back to the good side of the world. These are great ideas. This spirit is magnificent. But who are most responsible for these ideas? Oh, secular-minded men? I will not give you the three names at once. First one was John the 23rd. Who did more for our love of humanity today than this man? Who? August Colt, with his supposed love of humanity, never wrote a line comparable to John's love of the poor. He opened the council, brought the world into it. Protestants, Orthodox, Buddhists, Hindus, Communists, everyone was welcome. As one poor workman said about the Vatican one day, he's not interested in politics at all, except in as much as politics is related to us poor people. That's right. He was the one who made the world conscious of the love of humanity, even when, for example, we used our science to send an astronaut around the Earth. Because I remember when that happened, John the 23rd quoted the book of Genesis and said, God said, rule over the earth and subject it. He saw this young American astronaut as indicating the great scientific progress of mankind. No wonder his last words were, Lord, that they may be one. And then that human side of John, uh, great big fat man with he could reach out those great arms of his, almost like the fleshy columns of Bernini, to bring all mankind within his grasp. One day he went into a prison. Visited the prisoners, and as he passed one cell, he said, who's in there? The warden says, that's the death cell. That man in there killed his wife. John spoke to him from outside the bars. He wouldn't answer, Pope John. So Pope John said to the warden, let me in. The man faced the wall, would not turn around. John said to him, young man, oh yes, he said, Why, what is he in here for? And the warden said, he killed his wife. John said, young man, I've never been married. But do you know that if I were married, I might have killed my wife, too? With that, the prisoner turned around and embraced John. This is the humanity that he taught us to love. Now let's go to science and the world of technology. Who has done most? 
to elevate the dignity of science, to give it a new view of things, and almost to write a scientific genesis. Oh. Tayard de Chardin. This great French scientist, as a little boy, was interested in rocks. And he was interested in rocks somehow or other because he saw the, the creative hand of God inside of the rocks. He grew up with a great devotion to what was the favorite devotion of his mother, called the Heart of Christ, but he got quite beyond the pious conception of his mother. As he traveled around the world many times, excavated, dug, came up with prehistoric men, was inducted to all of the, into the great scientific academies of the world, there was one great notion that obsessed Tayard. It was the notion of, a, of an arrow being directed toward its target. First of all, there has to be a mind that directs that arrow. And there has to be a target fixed before the arrow is ever shot. Let that arrow stand for the evolution of the universe. And he believed in the evolution of the universe. But it's working toward a target. And somewhere there was an archer that shot it. So Tyard de Chardin saw the whole universe ablaze with Christ. All things were made by the power of his word. All things were for him. And so deeply did this embed itself in the scientific concept of the universe that one day in the Gobi Desert, he could not read Mass, and he wrote this prayer. Since I, your priest, O Lord, have this day neither bread, nor wine, nor altar, I am going to spread my hands over the entire universe and take its immensity as the matter of my sacrifice. Is not the infinite circle of things the ultimate host that will be transformed? Is not the seething crucible wherein mingle and boil up all the operations of living and cosmic substances the chalice of pain that you desire us to sanctify? So let there be repeated again today and tomorrow and forever until the transformation shall have been exhaustively affected in the divine words, this is my body. I wish I had other texts, time, I mean, but I have only four minutes, to develop the thought of Tyard. I might someday give his whole theology of science. But here was a man who brought science into the forefront of modern thinking for all men who love the world, because when this cosmos was sacred, and just as John saw Christ in all humanity, here was a man who saw Christ also in everything that was scientific and cosmic. And finally, who gave us world involvement? A Lutheran minister, Dietrich. Bonhoeffer.
Dietrich Bonhoeffer. A brilliant young man who said I would hate to live to be 40, and he never did. Was invited here to America to give lectures. He said, this is not my place. With the Nazi persecution going on, I must go back again to Germany. He resisted the Nazis and was put in prison. And just as John saw Christ in all humanity, Teilhard de Chardin saw Christ in the cosmos, so Dietrich de Bonhoeffer saw him involved in everything that was worldly, in every kind of social service, in law, in medicine, in everything. He left, he said, mentioned a couple of words that have been taken up by people who live by quotations. He spoke of a religionless religion, which unthinking people translate into a philosophy of life. By religionless religion, he simply meant that it shouldn't be too churchy. In other words, that the church should become involved. Here are his exact words as he was in prison. Just as in Christ, the reality of God entered the reality of the world. That was the incarnation. So too, that which is Christian is to be found in the world, the holy in the profane. So I would not speak of God on the borders of life, but at its center, in its life, in its prosperity. God is the beyond in the midst of life. And Christians must participate in the sufferings of Christ in this worldly life. And so he said that you never can look at the world without God and you never can look at God without the world. This was his notion. And he died for it. And on April the 9th, 1945, the Nazis came. Do I have 20 seconds or a minute and 20? The Nazis came to him and told him that he was to be hanged. The Nazi doctor saw him in his prison cell in prayer. He spent 45 minutes every morning in meditation, 45 minutes every night. He was led to the gallows. The gallows swung six o'clock on that April 9th morning, 1945. And the doctor who attended him said, in all of my 40 years of medicine, I have never seen a man so calm, so resigned, and so submissive to the world of God, to the will of God. This was Bonhoeffer, the real Bonhoeffer. And so the world is a great and a good place to live in. But who made it? God is dead men? No, to make room for the world. These are the men who made the world. And the world is worth living in, and the world is worth saving. If I could sing for you after that telecast, I would sing, it's a great, big, wide, wonderful world we live in. Bye now, and God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books, recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly life is worth living.